Welcome all of you to ALF Kuwait, Abundant Life Fellowship Kuwait online service. Today is 9-11, the 11th of September 2020 and we hope you're having a beautiful time. Uh, let's quickly jump into today's word. It's titled, Love Builds Up from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 1-3. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 1-3. We all meet strangers, right? We meet people in our workplace or people at home, people whom you don't know. And what are the questions that you normally ask them? The first would be, what's your name? Or where do you live? And there's one question you will always ask is, what do you do? Basically, what is your qualification? In fact, you're trying to get information of the person and the knowledge about that person. That's how the world recognizes you. Based on your profession, either you are a counselor or an accountant or a nurse, or a politician, or maybe you're just a homemaker. But this is what people ask you to find out who you are. From the time you were born, you keep on gathering information. And this information is stored somewhere in our memory. Uh, yeah, the, at certain age, we tend to grasp as much as information, especially when you're young. We learn everything we can from our parents and is free of charge. But after some time, we found out that this information that you're going to get, you have to pay for it. That's when you go to school. People pay money to school to gather information and knowledge. As you grow older, you pay more for your university degrees and life goes on like that. And we have to do it, otherwise we get left behind. And the world looks at what is your qualification. What do you do? What do you know? This is what makes us big and famous or rich or poor or in our life society. This information that you gather is what makes our future. So let's come to our today's verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not know yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. I'll repeat verse 3 again. But whoever loves God is known by God. Now, the first verse starts with food offered to idols. That is not what we're going to do or study today, learn today. We're going to see that next week. But today, we're going to see about a nugget which Paul inserts into this topic before he speaks about eating food offered to idols. He says about knowledge and about love, a comparison, a contrast, something which we might look at it as a conflict, but actually it complements together. We're going to see how Paul talks about it. We all possess knowledge, right? Some way or the other, some form or the other, we have knowledge. But what is knowledge? If you look at the root meaning of knowledge, gnosis, it is to cause information to become known, to have information, seeking to know, inquiry, investigation. This is the word knowledge. Some information that you have, that you are, that you're going to use it. That is knowledge. And Paul says, knowledge puffs up. The word puffs up is physio. Physio, like in physique or physiotherapy. Physio. It puffs up. It's about the physical. It's about the outward outward structure. Knowledge makes you, infl the real meaning of it is inflated. Thinking too much about your physique, your physical, thinking too much about oneself. It's all about me. I am this. I did that. I do this. Some people, when you ask them, what do they do? They're all, they're all about what all projects they did, whom all they meet up, and it's a very puffed up information. So Paul says, knowledge puffs up. And then he says, Agape, love builds up. The word for love is agape. Love is not just the erotic love between couples or filio, which is brothers. This is something of a love that cares, caring for one another, benevolence, charity, goodwill. These are the meanings of this word agape, love. Then it says, but love builds up. The word for builds up is okodome which means building up, 
edifies, edification, strengthening. These are all meanings of this word. Love builds up. So Paul it introduces to this concept where he says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So what is the meaning of it? So knowledge and love. Paul is not saying that we should not have knowledge. But what Paul is saying is, knowledge alone puffs you up, but with love it strengthens you. Knowledge is personal, but love is relational. Knowledge is about one person, about himself. But when you add love to it, it brings in other people into their life. Another way of saying it is, when you go for work, I know we all have applied for jobs, many of you are still applying, waiting for a job. One of the things that you do in a resume, when you submit, two main important things that you always do. One is your qualification, another is your experience. Just qualifications will not be enough for us to get a job. You need experience too. Why do they ask for that? Because these are two different things. Of course you need the knowledge, but people look for experience in life too. So in a way, knowledge is a qualification and love is experience. Knowledge is qualification and love is experience. Both are required to have a good job. And as you experience in life, as you grow in life, this experience is what counts more, in, which is more important than knowledge. In fact, when you go to a managerial position, you will see that it is not the degree you have, but it's the experience that you have that matters. How you've established departments and how you established a relationship with people, that is what is important. So basically, love establishes knowledge. Love establishes knowledge. So this is like a difference between knowledge and love. Both are important. Both cannot be alone, but together builds you up. Love puffs, knowledge puffs up, but love establishes us. Okay. One of the relationships, like what you would relate to, to understand more in the relation of knowledge and love, is a camping tent. I know we all have gone, we have, I've gone for camping in some forest or trekking. And this is something which we always carry when you go for a camp. A foldable tent. A tent that you can fold, pack and go. The beauty of this tent is it's got a vaccine or a plastic cover and a base. You can zip it up. No insects come in when you're in the forest or when you're trekking. But this plastic cover is in itself is useless if you don't have the framing and the pegging that you do to the floor. That is very, very important. The pegs and the frame, metal frames that you insert into these plastic cover is what holds the tent in its place. On its own, the covering is useless. But with the frame and the pegs, it strengthens up. That is like a relationship between knowledge and love. Both are important. One strengthens the other. The frame, the pegs, strengthens the fabric covering. And anybody done a tent, you will know this. the pegging, how you peg the, the this framework into the floor is how strong the tent is going to last, whether it lasts the weather conditions. Imagine a world without love. Can you, can you imagine a world without love? A good example of a world without love is if you have everybody like Sheldon. Now, I'm sure you would have seen the TV serials of Young Sheldon or Big Bag Theory, which is about Sheldon, who is a physicist, who knows so much about knowledge, but unfortunately, very poor in relationship. Knowledge puffs up. They're arrogant. Their dealings are arrogant, not relational at all. That is what. That is how a difference is between a person with just knowledge and no love. So I can you imagine a world full of such kind of people will probably, it'll be a disaster. So knowledge puffs up, makes arrogant, but love edifies and builds up. It is only people who can love. Only human beings can love. Nobody else can love this. And this is an aspect which God has given to all of us as mankind. Only we can love. Animals can't love. They can show emotions and affections, but that is not love. They can't love us. Your car can't love you. You might love your car, but your car cannot love you. 
You might love your phone, but your phone cannot love you. So you, only mankind can love. If you are without love, you are always about me, me, I, I, iPhone, iPad, iCar, iHome, iJob, ice cream, whatever, I, I, I. It's all about me. In fact, when we were babies, it was all about me and mine. It's my toy. It's my pen. It's my plate. It's my doll. And parents have to teach the children about caring, sharing, love relationship. This is something we have to teach as parents to children. So we normally, when we are born, we become born selfish, puffed up. But as we grow in life, we learn about um, about relationships. Now, love is everlasting. Another concept of love is the fact that it is everlasting. First Corinthians thirteen eight says, "Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away." See, knowledge will pass away, like tongues and prophecies. They are only for a particular time, so knowledge will pass away. Was uh, thirteen. Uh, chapter 13 was same chapter verse 13 now faith hope and love abides these three but the greatest of this is love so things will pass away but love will never end and the greatest of it is love this is so important so great that this love is a character of god which god has given to mankind and this is the image which we are created the image of god where God is love and that image we have. That's why only we can love. So this aspect of loving is so important. That's why it says in First John chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. First John chapter 4, 7 to 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. God is love. And that is the image that we are made in. Just like God. We are made in God's image. And we have that love. So anyone who does not love does not know God. So my question today is, do you know God? Do you know God? How much do you know about God? How much do you know about God? We know um, we, there are there are times when we say, okay, I know so and so person and so and so person. Like for example, if you are going to buy some food, let's say our neighbor Prashant, good friend and neighbor, he has some good cooks he knows in his restaurant. And whenever we need to order food, we ask Prashant to order because he will give a call to that friend because he knows the cook personally, and order the food, and we get it specially made, real good taste. And that is because of the relationship Prashant has with that cook in that restaurant. In the same way, if you were going to go to a car dealer shop or uh, going to buy an electronic gadgets in a showroom, and if you know a sales guy or if you are referred to a sales guy who is known by somebody or one of your friends, when you approach that friend, you get a good discount. So this happens because you know the relationship with that person. Uh, you know maybe they're old college mates, or oh, but there's some relationship, favor, some favor they did, help them each other. So because of that, you know the person. The question is now, do you know God? How much of God do you know? What do you know about Jesus Christ? The people during Jesus' time had the same question. Who is this Jesus? What is he saying? In John chapter 6, verse 42, John chapter 6, verse 42, he says, the people said, they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? So the people around are saying, what is he saying, I come, I'm come down from heaven? No, you didn't come from heaven. You came from Joseph and Mary. You guys were living in Nazareth. That's where you came from. So people didn't know the real truth from where the real Jesus came. He didn't know, they didn't know the truth. So they're wondering, we, don't, we know you as from your father and mother. Right? Then John 7 verse 28, John 7 28. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from. But I have not come to my come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. 
So Jesus is clearly saying from where he came. He's come from the Father. Yeah? John 10, 38. John 10, 38. But if I do then, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, I am in the Father. So Jesus is telling his disciples, you should know where I am coming from, from the Father. Even if you don't believe me, because of the works that I do, you will know that I am coming from the Father. So knowing Jesus Christ means knowing, it is not about the person of Jesus, but actually the unity he has with his Father, from where he is coming, the union between the Father and the Son, the obedience to whatever the Father does, that is what Jesus does. That is what is important in Jesus' life. And that is how you know God. John 14, 31. John 14, 31 says, But do as the Father has commanded me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. So Jesus does everything for the Father. So in fact, if you know what Jesus did, or if you regard and study about what Jesus did on the earth, you will be knowing what God the Father requires and likes and knows. This is very important. So therefore, knowing Christ is the, is a knowledge of his unity with the Father, his obedience and love as the one whom God has sent. That is knowing Christ. That is knowing Christ. Okay? So it's, knowing Christ means knowing the Father. The more you, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what Jesus said. So coming to a key verse in verse 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Now previously we saw that, do you know God? You know God. But now here Paul says, if you love God, you are known by God. What does it mean to be known by God? Known by God. What does that mean? Known by God, which means God knows me, which actually means he is approved. He, that person is approved by God. He has chosen him. God has chosen him. God acknowledges the person and God is personally intimate with him. This is the meaning of known by God. If God knows you, when you say God knows me, which means God has chosen me, God has approved me, God acknowledges me, and God and I have an intimate relationship, a relation that we have. That's what we say God knows. Now, you might know the CEO of a company, or you might know the president of the country, or you might know the prime minister of the country, whatever big person, personality. You might know certain actors, but does that actor know you? Does the president know you? Does the CEO of a company know you? That makes a big difference. Which means the CEO or that person has certified you, has approved you. That's what it means. So in the same way here, known by God means he has approved us. So Galatians chapter 4 verse 9. Galatians chapter 4 verse 9. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn your back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slave you want to be more. You want to be once more. I mean, Paul is asking the Galatian church, now that you have known God, not just known God, but the fact that you are, no, you are known by God, God knows you. How can you go back to these elementary things of following some holidays or following some rituals or some, some uh, law of circumcision and things like that, which Paul talks about in the, to the Galatians? How can you go back to that? How can you go? You know God. God knows you. How can you do that? That's what Paul is saying. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14 to 17. Deuteronomy 10, 14 to 17. It says, Behold, to the Lord your God belongs heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord has set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them you above all peoples, as you are this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. For the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great, the mighty and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. Here it records in Deuteronomy saying, He is the Lord of all, 
Lord above all lords, God above all God, the most mighty God, the most blessed God. He is the one who chose you and your fathers, who selected you and your fathers. So circumcise your foreskin of for the foreskin of your heart, the outer shell of your heart, which has made it hard, cut it off so that your heart is soft. Don't let your heart be hardened. In other words, don't be stubborn. Don't be stubborn. That's what it says. See, any fruit, if you take, most of the fruits have hard shells. There are some which don't have hard shells, but they have a covering or a skin. Apple, plums, they all have skins. But if you look at coconut, it's got a hard covering. Or uh, banana, hard covering. You don't need these covers. Orange, lemon, um, and these are all groundnut. These all have hard coverings which you don't eat. But when you peel off those coverings, the coconut covering or the bananas or the oranges covering, you get to eat the inner fruit. So in the same manner, let not your heart be hardened. Cut off, cut off the foreskin of your heart. Circumcise your heart. That's what God says here. This is what is important. So don't be stubborn. If you have your heart if you have your heart still hardened over certain issues, then let me tell you, you have to get your heart circumcised get out so that you can live according to God's plan. All right? So don't be stubborn. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let, any, let everyone whose name names name the lord depart. let everyone who names the name of the lord depart from iniquity now paul is telling to timothy and there's a very interesting scripture here it say he says uh, on the firm foundation stands a seal and what does a seal say the lord knows those who are his and let everyone who who names the name of the lord that is everyone who speaks of yahweh the name of the lord Depart from iniquity means you have, should have no relationship with iniquity. So what is this? Where is the seal? This, found, this foundation stands or where is the seal that says here? For this to understand what Paul is telling to Timothy, an encouragement of the seal, you need to go back, go to the Old Testament, to Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. And this is a story of Korah's rebellion. Now many of us have learned about this story. This is a story about Korah. He's one of the Levites or one of the tr family line of the Levite tribe who is supposed to take care of the tabernacle works. So the Levite tribe of the twelve was selected to do only tabernacle work, to take care of the ta ta tabernacle. All its, the cleaning, the dismantling it, putting it up and back again, and as it traveled, to take good care of it, they were given in charge. However, from the Levite ta tribe, it was only Aaron's descendants who were selected to be the priest, only they could be the priest. Nobody else in the Levite family could be the priest. They were all in charge of other works of the temple, but not to be a priest. So Korah gets rebellious, hard-heartened guy. And he starts a revolt and against Aaron and Moses. He says, how come you guys are being selected? Isn't God God of all? Doesn't God love us all? How can you do that? It's not fair. You cannot. Uh, and he also brought in some families from the Reuben family, a few of the families. And they started rebelling against uh, Moses and Aaron. Moses cried unto the Lord, Moses and Aaron. And God said, I'm going to destroy all these people. And immediately Moses said, no, Lord, just because a few people don't destroy them. Don't destroy them. Uh, keep them peace. And the Lord said, if that's the case, I'm going to destroy this rebellious family group. So Moses went and told the people, tomorrow the Lord will show you. So there were 250 people from this Levite tribe, Korah's uh, relations, who came, rebelled against uh, Moses. So Moses told, bring your incense, bring all of your uh, incense offering, the, the lamb, so that you can offer your incense. And the God selects the one he has chosen. So you have to bring in front of the tent of meeting. And he also called the Reuben's tribe family to come in front and stand, but they refused to come. So Moses immediately went and told all the rest of the people, stay away from these families. Stay away from these families. 
and the next day what happened is the earth opened up split open and these families who rebelled against Moses and Aaron they were all swallowed up into the world of dead a, a mysterious kind of death where they all the earth opened up and they all fell into that alive and they were no more to be seen and the earth closed up after that and the 250 people of Korah's tribe they were standing there with the incense burner and when they stood there the fire of the Lord flashed upon these people and all the 250 people died on the spot and 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 this is a story uh, and a very interesting story but the story doesn't end there I want to show you certain pictures of uh, uh, the incense burner and this is a picture that we have here the one is an Egyptian one another one is what you see in all the mainline churches with the chain and the Catholic Church and other mainline churches you have that they burn this incense uh, in this to create the smoke smoke like effect or you also have the the one we use in Kuwait where they burn the Bakhur that's also an incense burner and this golden colored one this brass shaped one colored one and this is probably the kind of incense burners that these 250 priests uh, members of the Levite tribe had that's what they were brought they brought uh, to burn incense in front of the altar unfortunately they all died and this incense 250 incense burners fell to the ground so the law told them pick up these incense burners and Lord told to hit these them make them into thin sheets and you shall clad the outside of the incense altar we don't know if it's an incense altar the one inside the holy place or the one outside where they sacrifice but I believe it's for the outer altar where they sacrifice the animals and you need to clad them with these altars and when people see this cladding outside on the altar on the altar of burn offerings they will this should be a reminder to them so these incense burners or the laver it's called were made into thin sheets all 250 of them thin sheets and cladded upon the burnt offering so when people see it they will know not to rebel against God so if you go to numbers chapter 16 uh, the story is we pick it up from verse 36 then the Lord spoke to Moses saying tell Eliezer the son of Aaron the priest to take up the censers now these are the censers which fell down after the 250 people were burned to death out of the blaze that is they all came with the censers to the altar then scatter the fire far and wide for they have become holy that is this incense because of sacrifice of their lives verse 38 as for the censers of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives let them let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar for they offered them before the Lord and they become holy thus they shall be assigned to the people of Israel so Eliezer the priest took the bronze censers which those who were burned which those who were burned had offered and they were hammered out as a covering for the altar verse 40 to be a reminder to the people of Israel so that no outsider who is not of the descendant of Aaron should draw near to burn the incense before the Lord lest he become like Korah and his company as the Lord said to him through Moses so you see the story of how when God selects when God approves when God acknowledges certain family to do certain kind of job anyone who rebels against that will face the consequences anyone who rebels against will face the consequences but praise God today because we are known by God we are selected by God and he has approved us so we have nothing to worry so when you go back to the verse which Paul said to Timothy he said second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 it says but God's firm foundation stands now on the foundation of the altar is where this uh, seal or these bronze or brass plates were hammered into as a covering 250 of them I'm sure they must have had some designs and the designs were there on that it said the Lord knows those who are his the Lord knows 
those who are his. This is a promise for us. Let's take this as a promise for us. The Lord knows who are his. He knows us. He knows us. And people will know it. Anybody tries to harm you, let me tell you, God will take the revenge. He knows us so well. Not only the fact that God knows us, but God knows our requirements too. He knows our requirements. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 31 to 33, it records like this. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? 32. For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need all of them. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. God knows. You should not be worried about what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? Or what's going to happen in my job tomorrow? Or will my business pick up during this corona pandemic time? These are questions that is coming in our mind. What will happen if we don't meet the sales targets? What will happen if the business goes down and we'll be laid off? God knows what you want, what you need to eat and wear and drink. He knows. He takes care of it. He knows it. Only the Gentiles seek after these things. But the Father knows all <clears throat> that we need. The Father knows all that we need. We need to do only one thing. What is it? Seek first the kingdom of God. Let God's seeking God and His righteousness be the first priority in our life. Let that be the first priority in, in our lives. So when you know God, when you are known by God, He takes care of all of our needs. He takes care of all of our needs. <clears throat> This is very important. Seek God and His kingdom. There may be a time in certain lives that we will do certain things for God, but God will come and say, I don't know you. You know, when Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Verse 23. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So here is a story where since then, Jesus said, you might be doing things, but if you don't do things in love, and you read the full chapter of 7, you understand it. You didn't take care of me, Jesus said. When I was in prison, you didn't take care of me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. Depart from me. God knows you and God loves you. Let us be blessed in that. John chapter 17, verse 3. John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Knowing Jesus itself means eternal life. Just knowing Jesus means eternal life. Amen. This is our promise we have today. That knowing God is life. We have eternal life. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans of welfare and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. The plans that God have is so great for us. He knows the plans. He knows us. He knows us. He knows the plans. He knows what we need. Isn't that amazing? What else do you need? This is an assurance from Him, that from God, that He knows us, He knows our needs, and He has great plans for us, plans of prosperity and of a future, plans, plans for welfare and not of evil. God doesn't plan evil for us. God only plans good things for us. That is amazing. This is a great promise. And I want to take this take this challenge today and 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 remember that God knows us. God knows us. And because He knows us, He takes care of all of our needs. He has plans for us. And He selected us. He loved us. And, 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 and the key in all this is we need to love God. So coming back to our key verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Amen. That is a great promise. God knows us. God loves us. He cares for us. He has, he has blessed us. He has acknowledged us. He has redeemed us. 
the key is that we need to love God. So, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies us and strengthens us. Love builds us up. Let's be encouraged from the Word of God. Shall we pray? Father, let your words edify us. Let your love edify us, Lord, in the days to come. Help us to know you more, Lord. You know us so dearly. You know every bit of our heart. You know us so well. And such an encouraging promise, Lord, today to know that you know us. King of kings, the Lord of lords, the mighty Lord of heavens, above the heavens, the Lord almighty, above all other gods. It's such a privilege to know that you know us and you have recognized us, you've, you've approved of us, you've redeemed us and you know us and you, and you have great plans for us. Thank you, Lord, for the scriptures. We bless you. We love you, Lord. Holy Spirit, speak to each one of our hearts. Help us to know more about the love of God, the love of Christ. We want to know more, Lord, and we want to focus more of our lives on you to learn more about you, Lord, so we, love, we can love you. And we can really understand the depths of your love, the wide, how wide it is, how big and high it is. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us. Thank you for guiding us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all and have a wonderful week ahead and see you next week. Mm-hmm.